Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Ted Gardner. Uh, we're here at the Public Library of Cincinnati downtown uh, in the Library of Congress Oral History Project. And uh, we have the honor of interviewing George Cordry today. And we're going to find out about George and his exciting Marine Corps experience. Dennis Daly, our historian in the Public Library History Division here, is our videographer. And uh, so we'll get started. George, uh, where were you born? Cincinnati, born and raised. Okay. Where, did, uh, where what part of town? North side. North side? Yes, sir. Did you have a family? Yes, sir. I have uh, two sisters and, of course, mom and dad. Um, was born on August 22, 1924. 1924. At home, yeah. by the way. Oh, yes. <laughs> Not in a hospital. No. How about that? <laughs> well, that's, that's interesting. Was, uh, was your father uh, um, in business or? No, my dad was a, uh, during the Depression, at 29 to 33, he was, uh, uh, worked in the shoe industry. Oh, yes. But he lost his job and he went to work for the city of Cincinnati and finished a career with the Recreation Commission. Oh, isn't that something? He was with them for years and years. He yeah. was working and them and his buddies weren't and they used to always belittle him because he had a job isn't with the city something? and he only made whatever yeah. buck an hour or whatever he yeah. made. But he had a job. But they it? weren't working at all. Oh, <laughs> I know. isn't that funny how people react to yes. things? Yes. Well, uh, where, where did you go to elementary school, George? I went to, we were living on Llewellyn Street in South Cumminsville for kindergarten. I went to Garfield. Mm -hmm. And in that summer, we moved over into the Chase and Langland area on in Northside. Um, from then on, we lived over there. I went oh. through the eight years at Chase Elementary. And then into high school? I went, I took the Walnut Hills test and I passed, but my aunt was a cashier at the University of Cincinnati. And she said, she recommended that I go to a business school. Oh. So I went to commercial vocational high school. Oh, yeah. Um, did that 38 to 40, graduated in 40. Um, went to work for the contractor that built Winton Terrace. Hmm. They were from Chicago. And they uh, finished that project, and I was just 17. I wanted to go with them, but my family didn't want any part of that, wanted me to stay here. <clears throat> so I went to work down at the Mel Creek Barrier Dam. I'll be done. <laughs> during the construction. How about that? For an outfit from La Crosse, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And they finished, were finishing, and the lady next door to us said that the work for the Enquire building, 627 Vine, and told me that the government, Corps of Engineers, was looking for people. So I went and applied, and I got hired on with the U.S. Army Engineers, Ohio River Division. And I was with them for on and off for most of 38 years. I uh, went to their laboratory, Ohio River Division Lab, which is at that time was out behind the Streetman plant in Fairfax. Oh, yes. Hmm. And I was working there and uh, my boss came in one day, this is in, 19, in 42, summer, 
And my boss came in one day and said that uh, he saw an article in the paper. They were organizing a special reserve class in the Marine Corps that would bestow a NCO rank upon completion of boot camp. Mm. So I investigated. They told me that uh, if I enlisted and uh, completed boot camp, that they would uh, make me a sergeant. Wow. So I talked my mom and dad into signing. And on August uh, 22 of uh, 42, I became 18. <laughs> And I went into the Marine Corps uh, October 16th, 42. My gosh, well, you, you got in early, didn't you? I, yes, sir. I, I had to wait till I was 18. <laughs> Where were you when you heard about uh, Pearl Harbor? Riding around with my buddy on a Sunday afternoon. Yep. We stopped at uh, North Bend and Coleraine. An old established place was there then. And we were, I guess I shouldn't say this, but we were having a beer. <laughs> <laughs> when the news came over the radio about uh, Pearl Harbor. Right. Well, that's one of those times in a person's life that you never forget. No, I knew exactly where I was yeah. that day. <laughs> I should say so. Well, did, did you, had you known about the Marines before? Did you have any, any uh, oh, sure. uh, desire to go into the Marines? Well, yes, I heard about them, certainly, <laughs> surely, you know. Sure. Uh, what intrigued me most, of course, was the blues. Oh, yeah. The blue uniform. Yeah, boy. But what threw me, I, th I thought about the Navy, but I, the more I, clean bed, you know, good chow, clean bed, but it's pretty hard to dig a hole in a steel deck. <laughs> Plus the nearest land was five miles straight down. down. Yeah. <laughs> so that wasn't for me. Okay. <laughs> so that article about the reserve class did the trick. Yes, well that, that sounded like, uh, I hadn't heard about that one before. I don't think we'd heard. Well now, okay, so you were 18 years old and uh, where did they send you for training? <laughs> Paris Island, South Carolina. Oh boy. <laughs> the sand flea pit of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't, with, there was a whole, uh, a whole platoon of us from here who went together. Right. Um, we didn't, unfortunately, we didn't get to go to San Diego. Yeah, Paris Island, <laughs> Paris Island wasn't, uh, wasn't one of the resorts of the world. No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> And you called it the sand flea pit of the... Oh, they had... I never heard that even one. Even the sand fleas. Yeah. The sand fleas. Oh, my God. It was bad. Oh, my God. Because everything was sand down there. Now it's all paved over. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the original wooden barracks is still there. Yes. And they have a wonderful museum there, too. You know. I was 15 minutes into it, Ted, after 50 years I visited. No kidding. And we're 15 in there, and uh, the NCO on duty came up to my wife and I and said, Sergeant, we're, we're sorry, but you have to get out. I said, I, am, I haven't been here for 50 years. Why are you, <laughs> you kicking me out? I'm only halfway through. We're having, it's, it was 2 o'clock. 1,400. 1,400 hours. And he said, at 1,800 hours, we're having a chain of command change. Oh, big they deal. They were switching commanding officers. Sure. And whoosh, everything went dead <laughs> at 1,400. And we, had, we got booted out. <laughs> yeah, and that's, oh, that's a big deal, that oh, chain of command. Oh, yeah. 
Wow, it's impressive too. I've I've seen a well. Uh, so you went through boots there, and you paraded on the grinder and all that good stuff. And uh, yes, sir, I made it through. You had? <laughs> did you have a tough uh, DI? Oh, sure. But I guess there were some older gentlemen who were experts in their trades. Right. Electricians, carpenters, plumbers, what have you. And so we are all not 18, you know, they were sure. older gentlemen. So I guess they eased up on us some. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if they do that crucibles today, that 48 hours in oh. the field. I don't know if I could do that. Oh, I know. Even then, boy, that's yeah, tough. Yeah, tough, tough. Oh. Yeah, that pack you had to carry and all that oh, stuff. My. and waiting through the water and oh my gosh that that was tough for him. which, which reminds tough. me did you see the that pbs series of the pacific no sir it's on hbo and i don't have it yeah i'm the same way <laughs> i didn't get i'm, I'm kind of waiting ted to see if if it comes out in a package well it will yeah from they, the his, uh, through uh, the history channel i i saw i saw an ad in the Mm, I think it was Sea Power magazine, the Navy League magazine, advertising the fact that they would have a, there's a DVD available now. Oh, I sure want it, yes, sir. So you want to get that. Yes, sir. Well, now let's move along here, and you uh, you were there at at, uh, at PI for what, about uh, two months? Oh, Ted, I guess three. Uh-huh. Middle of October till, I got, when we left boot camp, I got a leave to come home for Christmas. Good. And reassigned, it was transfer uh, to Camp Lejeune. Oh yeah. So I was transferred to Camp Lejeune and I was assigned to uh, headquarters and service company at Camp Lejeune. Oh, good. And because I had gone to commercial high school here and and graduated as a stenographer, they assigned me to the legal department as a court reporter. Oh my goodness, hey. And that was a court reporter by hand, mm -hmm. not oh, yeah. with the stemata. Yeah. I wish I knew how to do that. <laughs> but there were three or four of us because we were handling general court marshals. And so there were three or four of us hoping that all, between all of us, we'd get it covered mm -hmm. because it was too quick for me. Mm -hmm. Verbatim, I couldn't handle that. Right. But we got it done and then they, they formed the East Coast Echelon of the 20th Marine Regiment, 4th Division at Camp Pendleton. Mm -hmm. And my unit became a part of that. And in, I think, late in the summer of 43, we were transferred via six day troop train <laughs> ride from Camp Lejeune to Camp Pendleton, California. Boy, that was a long trip. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Um, blacked out at night. Yep. You know, you, you did get to watch, go to look out in the daytime, of course. Mm -hmm. I remember we pulled into uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming, en route to the West Coast. And the whole train unloaded troops for some PI, um, a little calisthenics, what have you. <laughs> and the mayor of the town thought he'd been invaded. <laughs> Nine or ten passenger cars of Marines oh my gosh. jumped out there on the platform, so he, they thought they were being invaded. <laughs> That's you know, funny. We went on to Pendleton and uh, we were just assigned a barracks area and went into training. I had relatives who lived in LA, so the first chance I had 
to get a weekend. I jumped on the train and hightailed it up to L.A. because I'd never been there before, of course, and spent the weekend with my relatives. Oh, that's nice. That was good. They took me up to Arrowhead Lake and oh, boy. places that I wouldn't have otherwise of course. gotten to see. Did you get to see any of Hollywood? Only one night I went up all by myself up Hollywood and Vine. I stood oh, yeah. under the street sign. Wanted to see that. I wanted felt... to see Hollywood, and yeah. I I have no picture. No. Yeah. I just remember it. Went, paid my way into the Palladium to listen to some of the big band big stuff. Big bands, yeah. right? Great stuff. Oh, that was great stuff. I'm telling you, those. Those days were, they were wonderful <laughs> to see those big bands and uh, Then to get back to Pendleton, I slept on the floor of a coach from L.A. to, to Carlsbad um, and got a bus and went back to base, but <laughs> so I would be there for Reveille on sure. Monday morning. Sure. Now you shoved off for, uh, of course, the Pacific when you when you were through with your training, uh, what, where, where were you first sent out? Well, Ted, we, while we were on the West Coast training, we, as, when we arrived at Pendleton, we joined the West Coast echelon of the 4th oh, yeah. Marine. And together, of course, we began, we became the 4th Marine Division, but the 20th Engineer Regiment became two separate units, the 4th Pioneer Battalion and the 4th Engineer Battalion, separate and cohesive units mm -hmm. within themselves. We shipped out in January of 44. We were the first, I don't know how I say it, we were the first military unit to leave the United States of America with a, with a direct intention of going into combat. Really? Everybody else had gone overseas and restaged and redid this. And yes. Re when we left San Diego, you were ready we were for ready. the firing line. Right. We laid over one night off Pearl Harbor, looking at that island with the lights twinkling with mm. beautiful. We yeah, were about yeah. three miles out. Yeah. And then we left there and as a flotilla and we invaded uh, Roy Namor in oh, the yeah. Kwajalein's. Mm -hmm. the Marshall uh, Islands. Marshall Islands. Hmm. Marine Corps was, and I guess some army, I really don't know Ted, but they were, we were all up and down that chain. But we had, Roy Namor was our. Right objective right and being the first time 90 percent of us or more had never been in combat we're aboard our higgins boats and uh, we're floating around waiting for the charge mm -hmm. we go head for the beach and our sergeants are telling us you know hunker down, get below the gunnels, uh, lock and load. And right. We're all hunched over, sure. and lock and loaded and yeah. <laughs> in the charge position. They <laughs> drop the ramp and we go ashore and the guys are standing there laughing at us. They already had been all the way across the island. Oh, for heaven's sake. And had it more or less secure. Oh my gosh. And they're laughing at us. It was, <laughs> I guess it was funny to them. <laughs> Some of them having been in combat before, probably. Sure, kind of embarrassing for you. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, well, were the were the enemy pretty well um, pocketed on one end? On one end. Yes, sir. Yeah. And during the first couple of days there, I remember they still relate to that huge blockhouse that blew up on Roy. Hmm. The Japanese had a ammunition storage building 
and it blew. And I remember a chunk of concrete, probably as big as that desk, coming through, but I was able to dodge. miss it, do oh my. dodge it. Oh my god. But it blew up, it killed everybody within I don't know how many yards, including oh Marine god. Corps. Yeah, that well. was the biggest thing that happened there. I saw my first Japanese casualty. Uh, that didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. But I also saw my first Marine KIA, and that bothered me. Yeah. Every time, that, that really got to me. Yeah. Not, not the enemy, though. No, I know how you felt, because that, uh, that was something that... I can't remember, Ted, we were there a few nights. Um, we had one Japanese dive bomber come over every night, mm -hmm. all by himself, and he would drop bombs. The, the other island was, had the airfield, so he would target that airfield every mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. Forgot what we called him. Sound like a washing machine, his engine. Yeah, yeah. We had one sentry at, in our, near our outpost, near our CP, that was uh, beheaded overnight by a Japanese hmm. with a samurai sword. But we got through that and we went back to Maui, went back um, on an LST. Mm -hmm. um, LST, landing ship tank, being the transportation for the heavy equipment. Right. Um, flat bottom, go right up on the beach. Yeah. Um, we Pretty were, much rock and roll in the sea. <laughs> yeah. Those flat bottom. And it wasn't flat coming back. Oh, God. And we, we <laughs> towed, a, we had a tow, a, a disabled <laughs> destroyer uh -huh. at the breathtaking speed of probably two or three miles an hour. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we had to pull gun duty. I remember being up uh, aft on, uh, on the gun deck. And we, as you watched where we were going, you could see the swells. Mm -hmm. And the swells would bang into the front of that, the bow of that LST. And you could see the LST go. Just shiver. All the way, shiver all the way back <laughs> and right through you off the tail. I know. <laughs> Because it was empty and it was sure, flat, sure, and it just—it was a cork. Well, all the way well, back. it was part of the so-called tin can navy too. <laughs> yeah. <you know. laughs> but oh, we got, yeah. they got us back to Maui, and we went back into training again. Um, I was assigned H and S Company Battalion Headquarters. And I had a buck sergeant, Carl Worth, a geologist from Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. who I've never been able to come in contact with since. Is that right? Uh, even tried through the Marine Corps mm -hmm. newsletter. Mm -hmm. um, never contacted Couldn't him. He connect. worked for Gulf Oil. Uh, called Gulf Oil, and they couldn't even give me a record of it. Is him. that right? I know he made it back because we bet my wife and I went to his wedding. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't know whatever happened to him. My word. But well, we, we had already made a pact that when we went overseas that we would alternate operations. One of us was always going to be rear echelon. Okay. So Carl and I made a pact. We'll, I said, I'll go first. So I went. Roy Namur. The next operation for us, 4th Division, was Saipan Tinian. Mm -hmm. So it was Carl's turn. Oh. So he went Saipan Tinian. Um, and he made it through their good. Mm -hmm. And they came back after that 
extended tour, they came back to Maui. And then we went into training for our next encounter, yet to be determined by us. Mm -hmm. But they already knew where we were going. You will. Iwo Jima. Yeah. So we, we got ready and Carl, he knew he'd be rear echelon, I knew I was going. And Willard Carpenter, who was a corporal that helped us, was he was going. And we got ready. And we went to Pearl. And we, I think, they, we might have been there two days loading supplies and, and fuel, I suppose. And then we took off. And we listened to the ship's radio, and the ship's radio kept broadcasting Tokyo Rose. Oh, yes. Who said, boys, your girlfriends are back home with those four Fs. <laughs> the ones that are left behind that can't come over. They're just, they're just ignoring you all. And we know you're coming. We mm. know where you are. Mm -hmm. We know you're coming. That's all we got all the way across the Pacific. Yep. And they knew we were coming. <laughs> sure, we had to. Yes, it was. It was. Uh, it was. Some of that stuff was laughable, but at the same time, it kind of got under your skin a little oh, bit. Oh, sure. You know? And well, they'd play Glenn Miller <clears throat> music and. Oh yeah. You know, play all the big band oh, stuff. Oh sure. Now, uh, Ewo, we're talking about February of 1945. Yes, sir. And uh, tell us about your experience there. Well, D-Day was February 19th. Mm -hmm. And of course, everybody is, uh, well, when the, everybody is fed steak and eggs <laughs> at your final meal aboard ship. And I've forgotten exactly, oh, 0700 or something, we <clears throat> went over the side into the Higgins boats. And for those who are not familiar, Higgins boat is a small craft, uh, naval craft, about 60 men or so, uh, with a coxswain. And you, you float in a circle in a flotilla until all units are fully loaded and in their sequence and the wave ahead of you is gone and at a given signal from the from one of the boats with the, I guess the wave commander I, I don't know what else to call him he would just go ping and there are and then they our peel boats off. would peel off into yep. a side by side, uh, straight as line as they could get, and in you go. And you were under fire too, weren't you? Yes, sir. Uh, they had bombed and strafed Iwo, the Navy had, for 70-something days. Wow. Uh, continually, and there was a tr tremendous naval pre-invasion bombardment and all the, the only thing they must have hit is sand because they were underground. Yeah. Um, when dawn came, you could, there were, I didn't count them, <laughs> but they say there were 800 ships in that flotilla in that harbor that morning and the weather was bad. Uh, kind of a high surf, totally against what they had predicted. Hmm. Um, but it was a go then, uh, no turning back. And we, we were in the, as I recall, we were in the seventh wave and we headed for the shore. Um, the Japanese waited until uh, the first couple of waves was ashore before they opened up because they had all their heavy stuff back in the 
faces of these caves, Suribachi on the left, high ground on the right, and they'd just roll them out and fire and peel back, and you, you couldn't see them, and or even the aircraft had to be a direct line or they couldn't hit them uh, unless they could see them. Hmm. And the Pioneer Battalion's mission in, uh, in that instance is shore party, get the, get the supplies ashore, stockpile and distribute as required. And so once we hit the beach, we were there. Right. Uh, as and you were greatly dependent upon to get that stuff out. And yes, get it. sir. It, it was our job to Boy, get it ashore and distribute it to those who needed it, and they did. Mm -hmm. um, the forward units had only gone over a couple of terraces. The only they'd only gone. I know I'm not a good judge of distance, but I had four or five hundred yards. Yeah. Because all the tank vehicles were bogging down in that volcanic in sand. The, in the ash. They, wow. It wasn't sand, it was dry particles of ash. Oh my gosh. And the track vehicles were just spinning their tracks, sure. so to speak. That was hard that, on that was hard on the machinery too. Sure, wasn't and that's it? where the engineers that, came in. They brought in the steel planking, oh, runway yeah. planking. Sure. And they virtually, them and the Seabees, yeah. virtually built a road or a track so our vehicles could get, our tanks and other wheel, uh, track vehicles could get over that top um, hmm. terrace. And I remember going back to Roy Namur, I remember how they scoffed at us when we came in within the ramp went down and we're ready to go and they're standing there. Yeah. <laughs> so we, I remember that, we had no idea what the hell we were getting into. <laughs> what we were getting into. You can delete that. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> that, then, that adds color, George, don't worry uh, about it. <laughs> they, dropped, they dropped the ramp and the first, the first live vertical person I saw was a first sergeant from C Company who was attached, A Company was with the 23rd, B with the 24th, and C with the 25th mm -hmm. infantry regiments for communications purposes. We strung the wires and, oh, yeah. oh, boy. and laid the communication. Was this first sergeant, he already, Ted, had two field uh, promotions. My word. He'd been made a second lieutenant, and when I saw him, he was already a first lieutenant My because word. of the casualties of the units. Yeah. George, yeah. get your men, get your men dug in. Well, gosh, we dug. We had to get provide the CP, um, and we used some of that decking, some of that steel decking, mm -hmm. um, for cover. And we dug in, and we were there. We were there on that beach for I was. Most of our guys who survived uh, were there for 36, mm. 36 days. Rain and cold. I think it was almost two weeks before we could take our leggings and our shoes off. Isn't that something? Well, yes. that that's what a lot of people don't understand about about that terrible campaign was that. <clears throat> that we were, we were really caught unprepared, intelligence-wise, about the enemy. Uh, about their fortifications, yeah, yes, yeah. sir. And they they really held up, and it it lasted much longer than we had expected. Yeah, it to. we were we were told it was a three-day operation. Yeah. Because we were to join the rest of the units out there for Okinawa. Sure, sure. Now uh -huh. you you missed. Uh, Fortunately, you missed Pellew, didn't you? Oh yes, yeah, so that that was in the past. Okay. That that was and that was several months before. <clears throat> yeah, we when we went ashore, he would tell the fifth division on the left, fourth division on the right, third division 
in floating reserve. Hmm. Uh, because now, what kind of what kind of sidearms did you carry? Did carbine. You, carbine. Yes, sir. Staff sergeant had a carbine. B A R. No, not a B A R. Not that, a B A R. That was infantry. Okay. Um, the 4th and 5th hit the beach and, and got over these humps. And of course, as now is history, the 5th Division peeled to the left to get Suribachi. Right. The 4th Division peeled right. But the 3rd Reserve, the 3rd Marine Division was in floating reserve. After three days, they summoned them, they brought them in. Yeah. So the 5th went left, the 4th went right, and the 3rd filled the breach. Gosh. So there were three divisions involved. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we were there well after the Okinawa campaign. I don't know if it had started, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. But we weren't going to make it, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we were only supposed to, we were only supposed to be withdrawn as far as Guam and prepare for further right. advances. But the people on Maui petitioned Congress so rigorously that they wanted their Marines back. Now, they transported us all the way back to Maui. Isn't that something? To a flag-waving uh, <laughs> ceremony. What wow. We did when we got back to Maui. Isn't that something? So it was quite a campaign. Obviously, we didn't make Okinawa. The 3rd Division didn't. I don't know where the 3rd went, or the 5th for that. Where they withdrew, I don't know whether they went on immediately or only to Guam. But the 4th Division was, we were taken back to Maui. Mm -hmm and we were their Marines. Quite a tribute. Quite a tribute and wonderful support. Yes, sir. Wonderful support. Well, the, uh, <clears throat> the physical aspects of uh, Iwo were terrible, weren't they? This yes, volcanic sir. ash, and which we didn't expect to have to wade, wade through. Did we know about that at all? Ted, I, I believe that they thought it would be similar to a compacted sand, yeah, to yeah. a wet sand that, you could walk on. that would compact, yeah. but it didn't. It didn't. You had to go four feet across to get two feet down. Good gosh. Because it kept crumbling yeah. behind you. Oh. Um, matter of fact, I'd say I was trying to get a little deeper that the day that saved my life, uh, I was, had my sh shovel and I was, I sat down on the edge of the hole with another Marine and he and I were digging deeper, trying mm -hmm. to get deeper. And uh, two Marines, two officers had just walked out of the CP and walked around me and were right here when a mortar hit and they both collapsed in a V facing me and I thought I got powder burn or got hit but I didn't fortunately mm -hmm. so after it after a little bit I went around one of them you could see two holes in the back of his jacket oh gee the other one did not have any apparent injury from the back. Hmm. And I went around, got up out of the hole, went around to look, and, and there was a captain and a major. My word. Who had just come down to confer with our CO and told Major Partridge that they wanted to get the hell back up in the front lines where it was safe. <laughs> they wanted to get out of there. They walked around me and mortar hit and killed them both. Instantly, neither one knew what ever hit them. Oh, my word. It just took the tops of both of their heads off. So sad, so sad. And the one, the shrapnel went right through and out his back. Yeah. Um, another guy was, 
hunkered down alongside of a tracked vehicle and marine, and marine. And it looked like somebody grabbed a, the talon of a zipper at his spine, base of his spine, and just unzipped his back. It was just laying wide open in oh. two halves. I'm sure he never knew yeah. what happened to him either. Right. But those kind of things bothered the heck out of me. Oh gosh, oh I should um, say. Yeah. We actually, if, you, if anybody saw the Sands of Iwo Jima with John Wayne, mm -hmm. where there is undetermined a, a Marine or a Jap calling for a corpsman that first night. We heard that. Whoever, nobody moved. Mm -hmm. We were so trained right. to stay put, yep. as did John Wayne in that yes, movie. In that movie, yeah. But we actually heard in perfect English, so I don't know, ever knew. Never know whether, whether it, was it was a Jap the or, enemy or a, not. I know. a wounded Marine. My word. We, for signal purposes, we had tied uh, cord between foxholes. Uh, one, are you there? Mm -hmm. Two, okay. Mm -hmm. All night long, just to make keep everybody alert. What about your chow in battle? We, the Navy finally gave us a hot chow about two weeks into the. We ate <laughs> K ration. Gosh. <laughs> oh, brother. And water out of gourds, out of bags, you know, yeah. liter, liter bags, they call them, uh -huh. I think. But we finally got some hot chow, <laughs> uh, which was really great. But the day they, the day they put the flag up, Ted, on Suribachi, on uh, four day, on the 23rd, any, any Marine, I don't know about other services, but in the Marine Corps, uh, any time the first note of color sounds, wherever you are, you yell out colors and you snap too. Absolutely. So we were, as I say, on the beach and they, they heard the first sound and everybody snapped too and looked and mm -hmm. there she went. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought that bird was in here. Damn it. <laughs> he, he hit against the window. I thought it was in here. Anyway, that's, that's when the flag went up and everybody yelled. All 800 ships sounded their, yes. their horns and their whistles. And right. It was quite a sight, and yet it was only four days into the thing. I know. Thirty-some days yet to go. Yes, sir. Oh, goodness. Well, that... <clears throat> It, it's it's wonderful to hear you uh, relate what it was really like there, and um, after you finally secured the island, uh, did you keep finding enemy soldiers that were hiding, or uh, you know who had? Uh, it came, Ted. It. It came over the ship's radio. We were aboard a Navy transport coming back. Um, and the sea was rough too, by the way. It came over the ship's radio that the morning after we left, there were some 200 remaining Japanese wow. under Airfield One, the main airfield, who emerged and staged a kamikaze mm -hmm. attack um, into what was, I read later, the 5th Pioneer Battalion. We were the 4th Pioneer. <coughs> but they attacked the 5th Pioneer Battalion shore party mm -hmm. and they were annihilated wow. to the man. Yeah. That is to answer your question, yes, there were yeah, yeah. people left. Well, they they were they they were mainly a pretty determined lot, that's for sure. 
their philosophy of Bushido and all that sort of thing. Well, there you were now. You were you were uh, first sergeant. No, I was buck sergeant. Buck sergeant. Um, I got a promotion when I, as I recall, when we got back to the states. Right. Um, on Maui, Ted, they came out. The Marine Corps came out with a, an edict that those reservists, five B reservists who had accumulated 85 points could, could apply for transfer back to the states. Separation. So I had an opportunity of either, I, I felt the 4th Division was gonna do occupation duty. Mm. And for how long, I had no idea. Oh. But I had more than the, the more than sufficient points, so I applied for separation. I got transferred uh, back to Mare Island, California, quarantine for a week. That's pretty good duty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, beautiful San Francisco. And got uh, yeah, I got to see. I had been writing uh, some pen pals. One of them lived, she lived in San Francisco. So when we got back, to, when I got back there, we went down to USO mm -hmm. and I inquired about her and they happened to know her. So I got to meet her and her family and she showed me San Francisco. Isn't that nice? I stayed, I guess, well, I was quarantined, more mm -hmm. or less quarantined for a week. Mm -hmm. So I got to see a little bit, and then I got my orders to, for separation, got my ruptured duck and mm -hmm. 100 bucks, I think, and sure. a train ticket. So I went down to L.A., uh, where my relatives were who had befriended me going over, and stayed a couple of days with them, and then came by train back to good old Union Terminal. How about that? <laughs> and <laughs> and met, your family was there to greet you? Were, yes, sir. Oh, boy. My sister had grown like that. <laughs> it was only two years, almost two, year, two years overseas. But Why? She popped. She was big. <laughs> And I was discharged uh, on October 3, 45. Mm -hmm. 13 days shy of three years. And I came back here and I went back to work with the Corps of Engineers from, from where I'd gone. Mm -hmm. Now with all this experience, it's you had had. I'm sure that your employer valued you highly. Well, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know about that. I went back where I had been, mm -hmm. and a, a job opened downtown in the division office uh, for purchasing agent. Oh, good. So I came, I transferred downtown, and I stayed there until 1954, and in 1954, the new VA hospital on Vine Street opened, and I was one of the first three or four people hired up there mm. in the supply division, purchasing, and I was with the VA both here in Cincinnati at the hospital and over at Fort Thomas. Oh, really? Um, in the supply division. Uh, we really, our, our unit at Vine Street really obtained and furnished all of the office and related equipment, mm -hmm. not the medical stuff, but. Right. And then over at, over at Fort Thomas, I worked for the supply, but I was 
I was buying stuff for engineering and dietitian and pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And stayed there three years. Now, were you married at this time? Oh, yes, sir. I have never been single. I've been, this will be, <laughs> this will be 64 years in September. Congratulations. Thank you. That's wonderful. That's just wonderful. Yep, I. Well, I've then you, were, were you married when you went overseas? No, sir. No. Um, let me take that back, Ted. My wife and my mom came to L.A. to visit me, those relatives. Right right before we went overseas. Oh. So I did arrange and we, my wife and I, original wife and I, got married in Carlsbad, California, mm -hmm. before we shipped out of San Diego. Mm -hmm. Near the end of the tenure overseas, I got a, one of those Dear John letters. My uncle had gotten my wife a job with Crosley Broadcasting on in Camp Washington on Arlington Street. Mm -hmm. And she worked there and met somebody, and I got a dear John. Um, so when we got back, I had to dissolve that. Mm, readjust. And <laughs> then in 46, I met my current wife, who's a gem. Mm -hmm. um, well, you're a very lucky man. And I think it's it's just uh, wonderful that you, of course, you had you had this great connection with your hometown, and you'd had that experience, and you were ready to step right into civilian life uh, with yes, some sir. good training. To those out there who are hearing me, I could have gone back to school under GI Bill. Mm -hmm. I been a fan, a fan of the University of Cincinnati since I was yay high. I, sh I should have gone to school, mm -hmm. back to school. I would have had to do a year of high school because I was short of the necessary math for college entrance, which I didn't require as a commercial, in a commercial high school. No, no. So I, I should have gone back. I did go one year in night school, but I should have gone because as the years went by and me working with those engineers and other professionals at the Corps of Engineers, mm -hmm. I could see what they made mm -hmm. <laughs> and what I made. <laughs> and that was a bad move, but I had to go back to that job because A, I was married. Right, exactly. So I had those commitments. Housing, of course, was abominable. You couldn't find. We had to wait for somebody to die to get a two-room flat. No kidding. Yeah. Um, but we worked. We worked through it. Thanks to Beth. Right. Now, how about children? You have children. I have a daughter, a uh, single daughter who's has two children. Uh, one is a graduate of. Wilmington College. She's now working with uh, TSA over at the airport, over oh, Greater yeah. Cincinnati. Security. Security. Yes, sir. Recently did uh, 30 days up at Boston Logan Airport on TDY. Mm -hmm. um, while there, they learned to use this new body scanner, full body scanner. Mm. <clears throat> which is now being employed over here, I understand. I haven't been over there. No, I haven't either. Her son is a fifth-year senior at Ohio State in um, computer sciences. Unable to, because of physical, uh, not physical, but uh, financial restraints, has been unable to complete that degree yet, and he's working three days a week for the Ohio State uh, Hospital Med Center, mm. and three days for the center and two days for the pharmacy therein, and he's working part-time mm -hmm. at a fast food place, <laughs> trying to get finished there 
And of course, he hopes to get full-time state employeeship at the hospital. Mm -hmm. He's still looking for that. She's a dental assistant in Blue Ash. Her name's Jill. We have a son who is home with us, unfortunately. He just turned 60. He has a multiple sclerosis oh dear. Uh, since he was 21. So it's getting him down, but mm. he's hanging in there. Well, I, I hope so. I hope so. Well, George, you've just, you've had such a, such an interesting life. And uh, uh, I know how you value that marine experience. Never it's forget something that. that nobody can take away from you. Never, never forget it. It's oh, I should say. The, any, any humorous uh, incidents come to mind that you can recall? Um, well, I only, I only got hurt twice in the Marine Corps, and both of them were with my own mates. <laughs> we were practicing on Carlsbad. We passed the amphibious landings on Carlsbad Island. And my buck sergeant, Carl, he, we were practicing jiu-jitsu, and he flew, threw me over his head. And I landed on an empty, rusty sea ration can. Oh, gee. And my finger was dangling, my little finger. Oh, my goodness. I had to hold it up till I got back to the sick bay. Oh, God. <laughs> and another, another uh, <laughs> a practice landing, we were in the down below decks, about five decks, ready to go topside and over. And Sergeant Talon, I never forget his name, he'd land, still land on the bottom sack, which is about this far off the deck on the bottom rack. And he just leaned out and looked up to me and he says, don't you giggle at me or I'll stab you. <laughs> Jeez. So I laughed and he stabbed me. <laughs> No he kidding. hit me in the knee. I oh, for heaven's with the with the point of his uh, knife. I uh, didn't. It's a little numb, but nothing occurred. Oh, nothing sake. bothered me until I felt the blood rolling down my leg. Uh huh. I had to go to sick bay and get stitches, and I laid the whole ten day operation. I mean, the, oh, the practice sake. laying in sick bay. Oh, oh gosh. So the two times I got hurt. They were both by my own people. <laughs> How about that? Which is, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> Very good, yes. Other than that, there's nothing. Well, you were, you were very, very fortunate that you weren't, uh, you know, weren't uh, wounded oh, yes, in, sir. In, in battle and uh, in that, that terrible, terrible experience. Well, I'm telling you, it's just uh, wonderful to hear your story, Thank and you've been been a productive uh, citizen uh, ever since the war, of course, and raising your family and uh, paying your taxes. And I and didn't want to bore anybody today. I hope. Well, you it's haven't. Not it's been. been that. It's you. You've told a, a, a wonderful story. Very, very uh, intriguingly, and uh, we thank you for that. Do you have any uh, future plans, any sight set on anything else? That Stay on this side of the grass as long absolutely. as I can. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Better vertical than horizontal. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I just have a, a comment, Denny, for your audience. If I will stay forever, Two things. Harry Truman saved my life when he dropped the big bomb. I never find anything wrong with him having done that. The other thing is, if you like the life you're living, if you like things around you the way they are, take a minute someday and thank a veteran. Yep. That freedom is not free. That's right. Well, I hope that you, uh, you know, our great library here is uh, dedicated as a veterans memorial when it was built. 
Yes, sir. Thank and uh, the library has always been tremendously supportive of the military and of, of the veterans. And uh, I hope you'll come on Veterans Day, uh, 11th of November, because our great uh, library here has a, such a marvelous program in the atrium. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you there. And George, God bless you. Ted, thanks keep, for having me. Keeping them flying. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you, and sir. And God bless America. Thank you, sir. All right.